Hello, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Philip and I'm one of the uh, library team at Salisbury and I'm here this afternoon to do a tea and chat and we've got some poems and we've got some poetry and I've got my tea and today I've got my tea in a special mug that is a type of poetry as you can see it's you see it's a map of the shipping forecast areas. So we've got Rockall, Bailey, Fair Isles, Faroes, north at zero, south at zero. So if you've ever listened to that late at night, you'll know that that's a type of type of poetry almost that sends you off to sleep with the wind battering against your window. So um, that's what my tea's in. So anyway, let's get started and see what we've got today. So today... Um, you may not know, but it's Empathy Day, and obviously um, that's a day to celebrate um, uh, our ability to um, put ourselves in other people's situations and understand their feelings. Um, I think like kindness a very underrated quality, um, and there's a whole load of activities and events and talks that are going on at um, uh, empathylab.uk with authors such as Marilee Blackman and Chris Chrisetta Cow. Pester cow, excuse me. Um, so that might be worth looking at. So I thought, as it is Empathy Day, I thought we could have a poem called Empathy, and that's by George Eliot. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weight thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out, just as they are, chaff and grain together, Certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. Short and sweet, I think, that poem. But it gets to the nub of the matter. Have someone who's, you know, willing to listen to your, your worries and your perhaps mad ramblings. And it's always <laughs> nice to have someone like that. OK. And there's also another anniversary today. Um, it's 150 years since the death of Charles Dickens and um, it's quite appropriate really we have a reading from Dickens because that's the way he made uh, a lot of his money. He went round America especially and um, doing a lot of talks and having a fan club. I think it was almost like um, a pop group almost, a real star at the time. So the extract I've chosen is from David Copperfield. Um, and this is where David Copperfield goes to um, Great Yarmouth and is sent away from, um, uh, you know, where he lives with um, uh, people looking after him. And uh, it's Miss Peggotty's uh, relative's house by the shore. So I thought we'd read a little bit of this. It was beautifully clean inside and tidy as possible. There was a table and a Dutch clock and a chest of drawers, and on the chest of drawers there was a tea tray with a painting on it of a lady with a parasol taking a walk with a military-looking child who was trundling a hoop. The tray was kept from tumbling down by a Bible, and the tray, if it had tumbled down, would have smashed a quantity of cups, saucers, and a teapot that were grouped around the book. On the walls there were some common-coloured pictures, framed and glazed of scripture subjects, such as I have never seen since in the hands of peddlers, without seeing the whole entirety of Peggotty's brother's house again at one view. Abraham in red going to sacrifice Isaac in blue, and Daniel in yellow cast into a den of green lions were the most prominent of these. Over the little mantel shelf was a picture of the Sarah Jane Lugger built at Sunderland with a real little wooden stern stuck onto it, a work of art combining composition with carpentry which I consider to be one of the most enviable possessions that the world could afford. There were some hooks in the beams of the ceiling, the use of which I did not divine then, and some lockers and boxes and conveniences of that sort, which served for seats and ached out the chairs. All this I saw on the first glance after I crossed the threshold, childlike according to my theory, and then Peggotty opened a little door and showed me my bedroom. It was the completest and most desirable bedroom ever seen. 
in the stern of the vessel with a little window where the rudder used to go through, a little looking glass just the right height for me nailed against the wall and framed with oyster shells, a little bed which was just room enough to get into and a nosegay of seaweed in a blue mug on the table. The walls were whitewashed as white as milk and a patchwork counterpane made my eyes quite ache with its brightness. One thing I particularly noticed in this delightful house was the smell of fish, which was so searching that when I took out my pocket handkerchief to wipe my nose, I found it smelt exactly as if it had wrapped up a lobster. On my imparting this discovery in confidence to Piketty, she informed me that her brother dealt in lobsters, crabs and crawfish, and I afterwards found that a heap of these creatures, in a state of wonderful conglomeration with one another, and never leaving off pinching whatever they laid hold of, were unusually to be found in a little wooden outhouse where the pots and kettles were kept. That's a lovely piece because you can just imagine this house by the sea at Great Yarmouth. Well, I say a house, it's a boat. Um, and he's got this little bedroom for his um, kind of week or two um, that he's staying there. Imagine what an impact that has on a child. We often have places like that. We stay at as children and we never forget them. And I thought that was really, really nice piece from David Copperfield. Lovely stuff. Okay, let's pop that down. And I thought we would have next, um, because we had a request, um, I thought we would have um, some Hardy. And um, the person who asked this, um, uh, who used to work at Salisbury Library, she asked for Darkling Thrush. So this is for you, Eileen. The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy. I leant upon a copy skate when frost was spectre grey. On winter drugs may desolate the weakling eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlent. His crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. That was a lovely choice. Thank you, Eileen. I really enjoyed that. It was a great poem. Okay. So I thought we'd have, to go along with from that, some more collective nouns. We had some last time of um, different birds, uh, because I just think... They just roll off the tongue and they're really nice. So, and I've got some pictures in this book here, as you can see. There we are, look at that. Okay, so we'll start off with a loomery of guillemots. Favourite here, a murmuration of starlings. A nigh of pheasants. A parliament of owls. A party of jays, a raft of duck, a sedge of bitterns, a siege of herons, a trip of dotterel, their type of wader, an unkindness of ravens. I think that's a bit unfair on ravens myself, but there we go. So I always like a good collective now. Now there's lots of places where you can um, find out about poetry and I've just been um, doing a bit of research before I uh, joined you. Um, and one of the places that I've used quite a bit is called um, the Poetry Foundation. And they have a magazine of modern poetry that they produce. And there's lots of um, poems and essays and collections on their website. So that's always worth having a look. Um, the natural, per, uh, the national, sorry, not natural, national poetry library, which is based on the South Bank in London. Um, obviously, it's closed, but there's lots of online content there, and the poetry um, librarians who work there are putting free collections to discover on its website, and that's worth having a look. Um, and also, the poetry podcast of the New Yorker magazine is also worth um, having a look. Um, so that's. Um, some tips there for you to find out a bit more about poetry if you want to explore that option. Uh, 
Now I thought we'd have um, a bit of a long poem now. Hmm. Yes, I'm not sure what a group of librarians would be. Um, suggestions, please. A litany, perhaps. I don't know, but uh, we can perhaps think about what a uh, group of collective nouns or librarians might be. Um, I thought we might try the Lady of Shalott. Um, when I was at um, university, reading, listening to the shipping forecast sometimes late at night, you can always guarantee there was one student who had a picture of um, the lady drifting down the river in their room. Um, so I thought we'd um, try the Lady of Shalott by Tennyson. On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. And up and down the people go gazing where the lilies blow round an island there below the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow veiled, slide the heavy barges trailed, by slow horses and unhailed, the shallop flitteth silken sailed, skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand? Or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers reaping early in among the bearded barley hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listing whispers, tis the fairy, Lady of Shalott. There she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay. She has heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she say, to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily. And little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or a long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to tower Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two by two, she hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. A bow shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bows rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armour rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jewelled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one blaming flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war horse trod, from underneath his helmet flowed, his coal black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lira by the river sang Sir Lancelot. 
She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room. She saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated by. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curses come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning. The broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining, overtowered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, beneath a willow left a and round about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance with a glousy countenance, did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her lost song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol mournful holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were dark and holy, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the water side, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and garrily, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burr her, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this and what is here, and in the lighted palace near, died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, for the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space, he said she has a lovely face, God in his mercy lent her grace, the Lady of Shalott. Well, that was lovely, but I think I need a cup of tea. <laughs> hmm. That's a lovely um, poem, I think. And um, I know lots of people enjoy that. And it's one of those that you can pick up at school. And you can see why it's popular, because it's it's very quite easy to read. And it's trundled along. And um, it's really enjoyable to read and listen to. Um, we've got a few more poems and I've got to go onto my iPad now and uh, these are from um, Angela Piper, uh, sorry not Angela Piper, Eileen Piper and she's the um, mum of a member of staff of ours, Angela and she's written these and we had a few last time and I thought we'd have um, a few more. So I thought we would have um, one for the end of the day and one for the beginning of the day. So we'll start off with that. So the first one is Duncliffe Daybreak. As the day dawns, the early mist hangs serene and calm. The now of sunrise melts away, each shrouded doubt revealing clarity of a thousand hopes. The breath of now dances in the joy of knowing. And the fond for the end of the day is Jack Dawes, Homeward Bound. A gentle flight born conversation as homeward fly the family flock, chanting soothingly, each voice murmuring in the evening air. A happy sound with friendly overtones, each voice is recognised and shared experiences tell of pleasure in each other's company. The air is still, the sinking sun beckons the happy homeward troop to the roosting trees. I'm sure you've seen jackdaws and rooks particularly fly in the same flight path and go home in the evening. Um, I thought it was lovely, so lovely poem there, both poems, so um, thank you for that poem. Um, that was lovely. Eileen, oh, yeah, thank you, it was really good. Okay, so we've got um, one more poem that I want to share with you, and I thought we'd finish, again it features birds, but it is something that's um, quite, I know it's quite um, amusing, and it's by James T. Fields, and it's called The Owl Critic, and someone's come up with a collective noun for librarians, a susurration of librarians, I quite like that, sounds good. 
So this is the Owl Critic by James T. Fields. Who stuffed that white owl? No one spoke in the shop. The barber was busy and he couldn't stop. The customers waiting their turns were reading, the daily, the herald, the post, little heeding, the young man who blurted out such a blunt question. No one raised a head or even made a suggestion. And the barber kept on shaving. Don't you see, Mr Brown, cried the youth with a frown, how wrong the whole thing is, how preposterous each wing is, how flattened the head, how jammed down the neck, is in short the whole owl, what an ignorant wreck it is. I make no apology, I have learned owlology, I have passed days and nights in a hundred collections, and cannot be blinded to any deflections, arising from unskilful fingers that fail, to stuff a bird right from his beak to his tail. Mr Brown, Mr Brown, do take that bird down, or soon you'll be laughing stock all over the town. And the barber kept on shaving. I've studied owls and other night fowls, and I tell you what I know to be true. An owl cannot roost with his limbs so unloosed. No owl in this world ever had his claws curled, ever had his legs slanted, ever had his bill canted, ever had his neck screwed into that attitude. He can't do it because tis against all bird laws. Anatomy teaches, ornithology preaches, an owl has a toe that can't turn out so. I've made the white owl my study for years, and to see such a job almost moves me to tears. Mr Brown, I'm amazed you should be so crazed as to put up a bird in that posture absurd. To look at the owl really brings on a dizziness. The man who stuffed him don't half know his business. And the barber kept on shaving. Examine those eyes, I'm filled with surprise. Taxidermists should pass off on you such poor glass. So unnatural they seem, they'd make Odobin, Odobin scream. And John Burroughs laugh to encounter such chaff. Do take that bird down, have him stuffed again brown. And the barber kept shaving. Well, I don't know about you, but at the moment, I don't care whether the barber had a stuffed owl or not, or how accurate it was. I'd quite like to go to the hairdressers either way, as you can see, but there we are. <laughs> Um, but I really like that poem, um, as I say, and that's, um, that uh, is by, I'm just going to look it up again for you, where are we, here we go, so I've got my bits of paper, can't find it now, it's coming, here we are, here we are, here we are, it's The Owl Critic, and by, it's by James T. Fields, that made me laugh, that one. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for joining me um, this afternoon for our tea and chat. Um, next week, um, there'll be another tea and chat, and that will be, um, I think, with Steph from Malksham Library, and that's three o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, if you like um, uh, a good um, chat and discussion about books, uh, Salisbury Library does have it, um, its own Facebook page, but it also has a book chat group at Salisbury Library Book Chat, and there are some brilliant um, entries on there from um, lots of people about their book collections and what they've been reading during lockdown and the bookshelves they've got at home, which is intriguing if you want to have a little nose and see what everyone else has got on their bookshelf. OK, so um, I'll just um, uh, finish my tea and I wish you all a good afternoon and I hope you can join Steph next Tuesday for another tea and chat. Thank you very much for joining me and listening. Goodbye.